is risen. <laughs> Excellent. I just wanted to crack that because I love saying that on Easter Sunday. Um, and what a joy it is to be able to celebrate the epic events of Easter together. The death and the resurrection of Jesus, which unhinges us from our own limited capacity, from fear, from sin and death, and all the kinds of things that oppress humanity. The events that we are celebrating today changed everything for everyone, everywhere, including you. Is that cool? Good. Um, but how? So Napoleon put it like this. I'm hoping the quote will appear on the screen. Ching. Oh, well, it will appear. Napoleon said this. I know man, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of people would die for him. The empire of love, or as Jesus would say, the kingdom of love. What can that kingdom of love do? And so today I'm gonna to talk about what the death and resurrection can do in our everyday lives, especially right now as we're working out what this last couple of years has looked like and what's going on in the world and the uncertainty of what life will be like as we go forward. I don't need to name it all, I kind of know that we're all living with different degrees of uncertainty. So today, as we look again at the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can discover together what it means to participate and celebrate in his death and resurrection, not just today, but obviously every single day of our lives. So there's a curious little story that's sandwiched in the whole of this resurrection and death um, scenario that we have in the Bible, and it says this in Joseph, sorry, in John chapter 19, it says this starting at verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who'd earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. And this was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. And because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, these few verses are a tiny little snapshot of what the death of Jesus might possibly mean in terms of its liberation power. It is clear from this passage that both Joseph and Nicodemus had been secret disciples of Jesus. Up until this point, they'd been motivated by fear and fear had kept them stuck in a, like an oppressive cycle in their own lives. They had been the participants in the body of religious leaders which crucified Jesus. Whether they were personally complicit or not, they were part of the system of oppression that ended up with Jesus on the cross. And Nicodemus is mentioned here, and I think John adds this detail because we're supposed to remember that bit in John 3 where Nicodemus and Jesus had that conversation. If you go back to John 3, you'll see that that chapter is a conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, Nicodemus being a Pharisee, a religious leader, who comes to Jesus at night time for fear of what might, you know, he's afraid of what other people might think of him and what the other religious leaders might think of him. And he's got a whole bunch of questions that he wants to ask Jesus. And I love this chapter because, you know, it's got the most famous verse of our, of our time in that chapter, isn't it? John 3, 16. We can probably all quote that verbatim, can't we? We can all say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And even if you're not a Christian, you've probably seen that somewhere on a poster on a train station or, or somewhere. That is a famous verse. But actually, this um, 
this whole chapter is this conversation where Nicodemus is asking these questions because he's seen something in Jesus that he wants to know. He's noticed something in Jesus. He's like, how do you lead the way that you lead? He's noticed that Jesus is not just a, a teacher, but that there's something else going on, that there's something otherworldly about Jesus. There's something divine. And he can also see that Jesus is not afraid. Jesus is free to love. He's free to do whatever his best self would want to do. Jesus is clearly liberated and free. And Nicodemus wants that. He wants to know the secret. And how does he get there? And Jesus replies to him. He gives him an answer. He says, you've got to be born again. Like, that's a proper Christian term, isn't it? We understand the phrase, born again. In this world today, and sadly, it's mocked. But actually, Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about, born again? How can I be born again? And we know that it's not a physical rebirth that we're talking about here. But we're talking about being reborn by the Spirit. A regeneration needs to take place inside of you that liberates you from your own human condition. But Nicodemus is still confused. And so Jesus helps him out. So a couple of verses just before that famous verse, John 3, 16, in John 3, 14, it says this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. But when you're reading that, I don't know about you, but most of the time you're like, well, whatever that is. But to a Jewish leader, to a Pharisee, to someone who studied scripture, to somebody who would consider themselves to be a disciple of Moses, this refers to a little story in Numbers 21. And actually, if you've got a paper Bible, you're not reading on your, um, in your Kindle or whatever on your phone, there's a little bit at the bottom, a little footnote, which is go to Numbers 21, which is what I did. And it's an old story of the Israelites wandering around in the desert and they're being bitten by poisonous snakes. And they actually think that this is a punishment from God. So they say to Moses, would you please help us figure this out? Because we don't like what we're experiencing. So Moses goes to God and God says, well, make, get a pole and make an image of a bronze snake and put it on top of the pole. And when the Israelites look, hold the, the pole up, and when the Israelites look at the snake, they will be healed. And I'm like, first of all, what? A snake. I mean, why would God want us to make an image of a snake? Surely, if you're going to get people to look at something, you want them to look at something that's like life-giving, you know, maybe put a picture of, a, make an image of a crown or a dove or something, I don't know, but a snake. But Jesus is explaining to um, Nicodemus that something needs to be done to be liberated. You need to see the source of your suffering. And I think even back then, God is communicating that he is not the source of our suffering, but actually it's the snake that's the source of our suffering. And I don't know what was going on in Nicodemus' mind when we were reading about him in John 3, but for sure, when he saw Jesus on the cross, being lifted up on the cross that day, I'm sure that there was some revelation that dropped in place because he suddenly sees the truth. The cause of our suffering the cause of our pain, the cause of Jesus' pain, his death, his suffering. It isn't God. The cross in that moment becomes a mirror because it is us. We held the nails. The thing the cross represents, the death of Jesus, who is so liberating and so freeing, is because it is the truth. It's the truth in love. When Jesus is on the cross, two corresponding truths occur. One we see that our own human capacity leads to great evil, that our own human brokenness, our own human selfishness, our grasping for power, our taking charge, our wanting control, all of that stuff leads to crucifixion. It leads to death. But at the same time, Jesus demonstrates this incredible power, this love which can overcome all evil with good. It is on the cross that Jesus utters those words, doesn't he? Father, forgive them, even as he's being crucified. And so I guess for Nicodemus, the penny drops as he sees Jesus on the cross. Oh, this is what he's talking about. And I don't know what happened, but Nicodemus in that moment goes from being fearful to being completely liberated. 
Because if there was a set of things that you shouldn't do if you were trying, if you were afraid of the authorities, Nicodemus broke all of those rules because suddenly he comes out in broad daylight with Joseph and he goes to Pilate. Now, people didn't want to be associated with people that are crucified. You get that, don't you? If you're afraid, you wouldn't want to like go, go to Pilate and ask for the body. But suddenly he's not afraid and he goes to Pilate and he asks for the body, not just to Pilate, but in fact in front of all of the religious leaders, in front of all the community, where it's all a little bit crazy. Everybody is watching what's going on. Nicodemus comes forward, no longer afraid. And what becomes really fascinating and really cutting edge is that no one really collected the bodies of the crucified. The crucified were actually all thrown in a mass grave because of course no one wanted to be associated with them. Because usually they were criminals or political activists and you wouldn't want to be implicated. You would be fearful for your own life if you actually wanted to go and collect a body. And I'm conscious that we've got children here so I'm going to be careful about my next words. But in order to go and get the body, you would have to go through the most horrific scenes of past crucifixions and suffering. You can only imagine. And I don't even think we can really imagine what it was like. If Nicodemus was afraid of suffering, of death, of being associated with Jesus, well, no more. Nicodemus suddenly becomes fearless. Let me ask you, what would you do if you weren't? afraid. We've seen this transformation of Nicodemus and we're not even at the resurrection yet. We're still at the death of Jesus. But there is something so freeing about seeing the source of your own suffering. God is not the source of your suffering. God does not punish. He is not mad at you. God loves you. And as soon as you see the result of your own human capacity for evil, you can also see in Jesus on the cross a demonstration of power that is greater than you. A power greater than any other force that would try and keep death at the centre of the conversation. Jesus' love is the force of life. And when you see that you give, and you give in to that, you can overcome, or you overcome your own capacity for evil. You become free, free from a life of fear. I um, love reading about missionaries. And um, it's quite funny because these days, um, the UK was known for sending missionaries out. But these days, we have what's called reverse evangelism and uh, missionaries come to this country to help us out. But at the turn of the 20th century, there was a zeal for what I would call the one-way missionary. And that is men and women that had heard of the call of God in their lives. Like they had such an encounter with Jesus, the reality of Jesus, that actually they were just prepared to give their whole lives over to serving, to serving him. And so what they would do is they would, whatever nation they were called to, they would pack their belongings in a coffin because they weren't expecting to come back. They were expecting to die on the mission field. And in fact, often they would die on the passage going to the country that they were getting to. But they didn't love their lives so much as they loved God. And they were willing to give themselves up entirely for him. They understood that they were loved and they wanted to show this love. This is love. And when you look at Jesus on the cross, you're looking at a reflection of yourself because we need to acknowledge the limitations of our own power. Because left to our own devices, we end up with crucifixion with violence, with fear, and ultimately with death. And we've seen that around the world right now. But thanks be to God that there is a greater, that there is a greater love than us, and his name is Jesus. The power which Jesus displays on the cross is a power that we can get into, and it will liberate us from a life of fear. As a youngster, I never really understood why Good Friday was called Good Friday. I don't know about you. Like, it's quite a somber day, isn't it? Because we're remembering the death of Jesus. And I never fully understood why they put that word good in the front of it. And, and I actually did a little bit of research to find out. There are loads of different theories on it. But this is what I do know, is that we cannot have a resurrection without the death. And so for that, I am grateful.
And so today, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, um, the resurrection obviously matters. In John 20, we read this, Jesus is alive. Jesus appears first to Mary Magdalene, and then later, starting at verse 19, Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for the fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And I think we can all relate to being stuck inside a room over the last couple of years. Well, certainly in our houses, if nothing else. And I think many of us even understand what it is to be stuck inside because of fear. Certainly the news reports and social media and everything that we've been listening to and all the influences that we have, have have contributed to a level of anxiety and a level of fear. I think that's, that's a global phenomenon that has occurred. And here the disciples find themselves stuck. Fear has crept in. Their leader is dead. But suddenly Jesus is among them. In other words, Jesus is with us. That's exciting, isn't it? I find that exciting. Jesus is with us. The resurrection makes it possible for Jesus to be with us, to show up, for Jesus to be in places where we think he can't be. You know, he's, he can be in our homes. He, we've experienced him in our homes, certainly. And in the last couple of years, I would say that we have been in training. I don't know what Jesus is training us for, but we've been learning to encounter him in our homes. We've all had to master technology like Zoom and, and all of that. And I don't know what for. But I know that God has been doing something in us as men and women who love Jesus. There are no physical boundaries to where Jesus can be. And my best prayer for you would be is that you'd experience Jesus today here in your home, wherever you're listening to this message, if it's in the car this week. But what Jesus says in this passage is key, and he says it twice. He says, peace be with you. And remember, this is the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, when Jesus was talking about the events that were going to occur. And he told them it was going to be hard and it was going to be difficult. And the disciples didn't understand what they were saying. But he promised that he was going to give them a peace, a peace that the world could not give. And it's the peace of his presence. And we're so used to thinking about peace being the absence of conflict. And we think it's the absence of noise noise but in fact peace is the very presence of Jesus in the circumstances that you are in even in the presence of great suffering and difficulties and trials you can know peace peace is not the absence of conflict it is the presence of Jesus it's the presence of love this is love bringing peace in the midst of suffering in the midst of pain even when we're afraid and even when we're stuck. And I know that, you know, I feel useless sometimes praying for particularly the world situation and what's going on in the world right now. But I do know that I can pray a blessing of peace over that situation. But Jesus does something a little bit awkward in this passage, doesn't he? He breathes on them. You're like, what's that? You're breathing on someone. But the breath, the breath of God the very breath of God that gave us life. When we read back in Genesis 1, God breathed into man. It wasn't a cosmic accident. You were designed by God, and God himself breathes his spirit into humanity, and they come alive so that they might become image bearers to the created order. And here, Jesus breathed life on his disciples in this locked room, and he removes the fear. He is creating a new humanity, restoring us to what we were originally created to be. No longer limited by fear or our own human capacity, there is a power greater than us in Jesus to fill us with breath, to fill us with the newness of life. And here's what's interesting. Breath. Like, we know that's important, don't we? Obviously, we can't live without breathing. 
But when panic happens, neurologically, I don't fully understand, there'll be people far cleverer in the congregation that can explain this, but neurologically what happens is that we kind of go into panic mode and we kind of go into the back, back of our brain and our breathing becomes shallow and we grasp for air and it triggers our brain. We have that fight or freeze um, syndrome that happens and our body goes into survivor mentality. And when that happens, we can get quite defensive and it can be difficult to think straight and you can lose focus, become angry and make poor decisions. We can freeze and we don't know what to do. But what I have been reading about and what I have been learning about is the best thing that you can actually do in that moment is to breathe. Take deep breaths. And over this past couple of years, I've been learning a, a really simple technique, which is just basically stopping and breathing and noticing Jesus. It's really, really simple. And actually, I've discovered that in the slowing down and in the being very conscious of the presence of Jesus has caused me to walk more closely with Jesus. Jesus is the creator of humanity, and he knows how our bodies are wired and he knows how we are made, and he knows what we need when we need it. So receive the breath of God. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, reminding them that this was always his plan, he would have a humanity with it that would image him to the world for us to be the kind of humans that he was. He isn't meant to be some sort of leader that we admire from afar, but the very presence of love in our lives that enables us to be the type of humans that we were called to be free, called to be free, loved and whole. Peace be with you. So as I come into land, can I encourage you to take a couple of minutes today in your day just to consciously invite Jesus into your space to be aware of his nearness. If you don't understand or know what the events of Easter are about or how it impacts you, I would really love you to come and chat to me or chat with somebody that you that, that you came with today and ask them a few more questions what is it she was talking about how can i live this life that's not dominated by fear how can i live a life that is free how can i get to know jesus and this brings us back to what we learned about in john 3 that you must be born again nicodemus didn't understand what it was to be born again by like human capacity but it's by the spirit by the divine spirit of God. Those disciples went on to demonstrate lives full of love, no longer constrained by fear, no longer locked in. They became free to live, to love, to spread love, to live transformed lives. And today we're not just remembering an event in history, we're entering into a present reality. Jesus is alive. Jesus is with us. Jesus is bringing peace. Jesus is bringing forgiveness. Jesus is bringing renewal and he is giving us love. Peace be to you. Today, as we celebrate baptisms, each person being baptized has experienced this incredible love. So we're going to enjoy celebrating that. And, um, oh, has Tony disappeared? He was there, wasn't he? He's gone over there. I was going to smile at him and say, we're excited for the baptisms today.